Yeah, hello there. You're very welcome along to Allianz League's Press Pack, where we discuss all the major stories dominating the GEA world in the last seven days or so. Joining me tonight are Vincent Hogan of the Irish Independent and Kieran Cunningham of the Irish Daily Star. Both very welcome along, gents. Thanks, Damien. Kieran, just start with you. Maybe last weekend, one of the talking points was when um, Tyrone's Ben McDonald came on the field, and before long, Hall David Clifford down, mm. and there was all sorts of commentary then and typical negative, cynical Tyrone. Uh, we need to look after our star players a lot better than that. Where did you stand on the whole thing here? Well, if you, if you watch the footage, it, it looked fairly damning for Ben McDonald. But the, the thing is, with those situations, you never know, did anything happen before the cameras went on them? Mm. Um, like it was brought up, like Ben McDonald was a sub who was brought on. Six minutes later, he tangles David Clifford, who's on a second yellow and is in a send off. So that does get people suspicious. but. Um, I can understand why, in Tyrone in particular, they're annoyed over the coverage of it because there was an incident in the game as well where Paul Murphy was wrestling with Peter Hart. And Peter Hart, um, it was very similar incident. Peter Hart was mm. sent off. And Tyrone do feel like they're the, the county above all others that have been branded as cynical and will cross the line and do anything to win. And there are plenty of games out there, and there's evidence where that has happened with Tyrone, as there are pl there's plenty of evidence that's happened with Kerry, with Donegal, with Dublin, with Mayo, mm. with all the top teams in particular, that there's no angels out there. You know, the, and I think this is good, uh, particularly high degree of coverage because of David Clifford's profile, because he is the most exciting player we've seen in a long, long time. Like he's, I just love watching him. Like he's one of those guys. If you didn't have a particular interest in the game or you weren't working at the game, you'd go just to watch him mm. and just watch what he does. And like, uh, I was at that qualifier in, um, or the Super 8s game two years ago in Monaghan, which is a great day where, where he got the late goal. Dramatic, yeah. Yeah, dramatic. But I remember his reaction. That was his first season. He was just out of minor. And he got an incredible goal. There's one photo that shows the angle and all the legs he, you know, the, he's nothing to aim at. It's incredibly good into the net. But afterwards, I remember his demeanour after it and talk, you know, giving a few earfuls to the Monaghan defenders. And going back generations, no choir boys have ever played in the Monaghan full back line. So you can only imagine what he got that day. Yeah. And he will get that every time he comes out. But so does Michael Murphy, so does Paul Mannion. Yeah, it goes with the territory. Yeah, it's hardly breaking news that defenders can be unscrupulous. And I think just as diets, dietitians, uh, focus on recovery, S&C is advancing all the, all the way, so too are tactics. And, you know, Tyrone do feel hard done by. I think there's a perfect storm after breaking here in the sense that it's this player of a generation and those of us who are neutrals are so happy that he's not in Australia, that he's playing mm. our game. But it, like the, the TV pictures, they did look damning. I mean, because by the time TV picked it up, he was pinned to the ground and he had his hands out like that. Mm. So you're kind of saying, well, it looks fairly clear cut. It looks as if the instigator is the defender. And logically, the defender has just come in. He's only six minutes on the field. He knows David Clifford is already on a yellow. Vinny, and look at his face there. He's incredulous. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's is, furious. Is this going to affect his enjoyment he, he, of look, Gaelic he, games going he's down furious, the years? But the big problem for David Clifford was actually the first yellow. Because the moment the star forwards get one yellow, they're a sitting duck. And that was a problem for Clifford here. Now, my, un my information, my understanding is his first yellow was for complaining to Fergal Kelly about Niall Morgan taking so long over free kicks mm. because obviously it was in Tyrone's interest to play down the clock, playing into the wind. Now, he was entitled as captain, as Kerry captain, mm. to go to Fergal Kelly. So are we to take it he was abusive to Fergal Kelly? We don't know. The other side of that is we've got to not demonise defenders here and make out all the forwards as saints. Yeah, yeah. We saw Dublin close down an All-Ireland final in 2017 when Dean Rock got that late free and systematically the Dublin forwards pulled uh, Mayo backs down as they tried to work the ball out. So I think for, defenders can feel very hard done by, it's not just Tyrone, it's defenders right across the country. Yeah. But this is a perfect storm, I mean, and it's because it's this magnificent young player. Yeah, and like there's no, nobody can say they're exempt from cynicism. Like the, the only All-Ireland Kerry won in the past decade was against Donegal in 2014. And later on at that game, if you remember, Donegal had to kick out and Barry John Keane ran in and kicked the ball away, mm -hmm. which was a very incredibly mm -hmm. cynical act. And that's a forward. And it's a Kerry forward who is supposed to be an exalted species. But um, mm -hmm. 
I do think, in a way, this might help David Clifford down the line. I do because too. it's only, I agree. It's only yeah. early February, but now there's been so much around this. I think referees talk, referees watch what goes on, read what goes on, listen to the debates around things. I think referees will be saying to their umpires now, watch David Clifford, watch what's going on, is there something going on there? It's in the public And it might help him down the line, the big game. Well, I think even better than that, Kieran, is it's now putting a focus on this age old GA reflex, the cop out. Uh, they were both at it. Throw the two yellows. In other words, I don't really know what's happened, so just throw the two yellows. And it exasperates people watching that because that's what it is. It's a cop out. And the umpires are, they were close enough to that incident to see how it started. And I would, looking at Clifford's reaction, he was furious mm. that this age old cop out, two yellows, knowing the consequences for him, zero consequences and for also, the And also he turned to the umpire yeah. who was like, four or five feet yeah. away and said, how did you not see what's going on? That's my point, Kieran. Yeah. You made the point that God knows what happened beforehand, yeah. but the umpire surely would yeah. have had a good, clear view of That's that. It. They, they have a lot to answer for over the years, don't they? I mean, it, it, there's a tendency for referees to bring in close family members yeah. um, or, or even neighbours or club, club mates to, to help them with the games. They do let a lot go, Kieran. But... Um, is that going to change? That might change for an All-Ireland final, say. You might be able to put qualified referees in as all the umpires or All-Ireland semi-finals or provincial finals even. But at a league game or a club game, it is going to be friends of referees. Yeah. There's no way around that. Yeah. Like, like even like most club games, it's uh, umpires from the two clubs yep. and they're yeah. always biased. Yeah, like everybody at club level knows that umpires and often linesmen are always going to just go, vote, go with their own club. Like, so how do you get around that? I think sometimes... Uh, umpires kind of get dragged into watching the game. Mm. You know, they're just, they kind of forget what they're there for. Yeah. And, and often it depends on the referee keeping them on their toes. And some referees are better at that at, than others, I think. But they, they, they do get the umpires to engage more with them. There might be an alarmist here, Vincent. A few years ago, Brian Corcoran, well, a good few years ago now, while Brian Corcoran was playing centre-back for Cork, all the opposition, uh, goalkeepers, managers, players, basically directed to keep the ball and the puck outs away from Corcoran. And it grew to such an extent that he fell out of love with the game and he, he left the scene for a few years before he came back as a forward. Will, will constant um, aggression in David Clifford's face and the, the constant close attention, the triple marking, double marking, will that wear him down eventually? He's only such a young chap and he's doing such a good job, but will it wear him down eventually? Well, is it any different to what Morris Fitzgerald got or Bernard Brogan or yeah. Peter Canavan, yeah. one of the greatest corner forwards I've ever seen, also one of the smallest. And I remember going up to Ulster Championship Games, Tyrone against Derry, and Canavan, as he got on in his career, he laid down the terms and conditions. Some of his battles with Kieran McKeever of Derry, for example. Mm. And you, it was nearly pay-per-view watching Canavan going in and laying down the terms of engagement rather than being the, the, the one who was being bullied. I think it's part and parcel of the game. It's not new. It's yeah. been there as long as I've been watching football. Right. And I, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's an unpalatable truth that David Clifford is going to have to deal with this. Yeah, yeah, and you're right, those battles with Armagh were, were legendary, the ones kind of looked out for himself. Would you go along with that, Kieran? Uh, yeah, like, he's going to get this treatment, but he expects that. Mm. Peter Keane expects that, because all the top forwards get it. Mm. Like, you're going to get... If you have that kind of talent, you're always going to get special treatment. And... Uh, it's always been the case. And, you know, managers have highlighted, like, I think um, a few years ago, Jim McGuinness might have highlighted what was being done to Michael Murphy and I think mm. uh, James Horne might have brought up stuff about Aidan O'Shea I think a few years ago that uh, you know asked for more protection a few times managers have come out and asked for protection for, for particular players but nothing really happens because I think it also should be said Kieran, that there's no evidence that David Clifford isn't able for this yeah, yeah. I, I think what happened on Sunday was just so ridiculous in his eyes. That's what he was reacting to. He's been well able to deal with the physicality. We saw the state of his jersey at the end of the Dublin game in the league a few weeks ago. Yeah. And he was smiling. And, and you know, he's won two All Star he won two All Star yeah. awards before his twenty first birthday. Mm. So that's yeah. no, that just yeah. shows it Absolutely. doesn't really phase. Okay. And he's gonna win all Ireland and he might well win one this year. So yeah. I don't think he's gonna be put off the game. Okay, interesting debate nonetheless. Last weekend also, um, Andy McEntee Saw, saw red with a bit of temper because he felt that maybe only about two seconds of extra time he felt was warranted was played <coughs> after the three minutes that were allowed for injuries in their narrow <coughs> feet to count to, to Mayo. 
And he, he used the example of Dublin and Monaghan, where time ran over by a huge amount, as an example of the imbalance that's out there in terms of timekeeping. Where do you guys stand on that? Is it time to bring in the stop clock like ladies football have? Uh, are we hostage to fortune in, in terms of timekeeping? Well, I was amazed to read a column by my, my colleague, Colm Keyes, in yesterday's paper that outlined the fact that these, this equipment is already in all ma major grounds, that it's all there, but Central Council has, for different reasons, said, no, we're not ready to impose this. Now, the one question I would ask, in Andy McEntee's situation, and he may, it may well be valid, I believe there was a Mayo player who went down holding his head, Andy was more or less suggesting it wasn't genuine, and therefore there should have been about 30 seconds of more time played. And in a one-point game, those mm. 30 seconds could have been vital. But if it's not the referee doing the time, Andy is going to go looking for the fifth official who's in mm. charge of the time. He's still going to have a problem with a GA official there. So I'm not sure it's going to resolve it, because people will have their own ideas of what should have been played and what shouldn't have been played. Mm. I was at Croke Park on Saturday night. I thought there were a lot of stoppages in the allotted added time, and I didn't have a huge issue. I did think the referee would blow it up after Rory Beggins, 45, drifted wide. I thought he'll blow it up in the kick-out now. But do you know what? I could see why there was another three minutes played. Mm. And would you go along with that, Kieran? I mean, it, there's probably a lack of consistency. Usually during the summer, you expect at least three minutes will be played, and maybe people can, can live with that. This weekend, though, it did seem to be an imbalance there. There was an imbalance, but uh, no, I was at the Dublin Monaghan game as well. And for those six minutes of injury time that were announced, there was a huge amount of stoppages. So it didn't really surprise me that it dragged on. But it, it, there's far too much asked to the referee, yes. you know, especially with the rule changes coming yeah. in and how they're supposed to adjudicate now with the, the advanced mark, particularly club level. Uh, on a mucky day and you can hardly see pitch markings. That it's ludicrous now that a game so fast that they don't, uh, and, and with so many players on the pitch and so many, you know, there's blood subs, there's subs, there's, there's changes all the time. They just, uh, there's too mm. much asked yeah. of them. And so timekeeping is a very simple thing <coughs> that could be taken off to make life a little bit easier. I fully agree with Kieran. Uh, last year's All-Ireland Final, Vincent, I, I got wired up to the inside line of the referee and he communicates with kit men, uh, medics, physios, the Muirfernas, managers, he's linesmen, he's umpires. There is a huge amount going on, isn't there? And it's unfair. And also, yeah. sorry if I could cross yeah. you, but just a very quick one. In Croke Park, there's a big screen there, and he'll know from the yeah. reaction of the crowd if he's got something wrong, mm. or if people think he's got something wrong. That puts pressure on straight away as well. Like, there's so much pressure. I, I think there's also a, a culture in the GAA of our conduct towards officials, and we question everything. I mean, I've ended up doing umpire at loads of my son's hurling matches, and <laughs> And the, the abuse you Completely take, neutral, right? <laughs> and the abuse you expect to take. Was that for your articles now? Uh, uh, we... No, no. This <laughs> is George Kim, my son. But the, the abuse you take from a, a, the fullback on the opposing team, and it just seems this natural setting we have. How many times at a GA match do you hear the words, a ref, mm -hmm. even if he's given the free? Mm. Yeah. Great stuff, lads. Coming up in just a few moments, we'll take a closer look at the GEA financial report for 2019. That was published yesterday and it read very well for Crow Park.
Welcome back to Pressback. Now, yesterday, the financial accounts for the GEA were released. 24 million uh, record revenue, uh, 73.9 million record revenue, excuse me, 22% increase in gate receipts. And Kieran, just looking through the, the figures, 12% increase in match day attendances as well, and gate receipts up to 36 million. At a time when people are criticising the quality of fair on view at times, it's impressive reading, isn't it, from a, an overall point of view? Yeah, well, any business that, uh, you know, returned revenue is 73.9 million last year, which is an increase of 16%. Like any business that increases revenue year on year in Ireland is 16%. You know, you have to applaud them. But then you have to ask the question, should you be thinking of the GA as a business? And like last year was an unusual year and they did a couple of concerts, they did an All-Ireland Football Final replay and they had a hike in ticket prices. And that, that, that went a long way to, to, towards that increase in revenue. But for the first time, there's a, the, when you dig through those accounts, the most interesting thing is for the first time, they haven't given an individual breakdown, but they've said the top 14 executives in, um, in Croke Park, in GA, are, uh, earn an average of 125000 a year each. And if you factor in the employer pension contribution, PRSI, is over 150000 each. Mm. So uh, to put that in context, um, John Tracy, CEO of Sport Ireland and the Sports Council before that, for guts of 20 years, he would be on about 115000 a year because it's on the civil service scale. And when you think that's an average of the top 14, then it's fair to speculate that uh, Tom Ryan would be on at least a quarter of a million, if not 300000 a year which you're getting close to John Delaney territory. And like the, Would you the think FA, you'd be on a, no, a figure like that? Oh, absolutely. If, that, if that's the average of the top 14, if the average is roughly 150 when you factor in pension contribution, then the guy at the top is surely close on that. Close on it, definitely. So you have to question, people look at that, and there is, you know, people at the, at the top of the GA hate the word disconnect when people bring this up because they argue, and rightly, that they're volunteers, that a lot of them, like Tom Ryan himself, are involved at underage level, involved at their clubs, etc. But in an it is, for all the talk of professionalism, the GA, except for a tiny percentage of people, is an amateur organisation. And it's a tiny amateur organisation, a tiny island on the edge of Europe, and you're paying way over the odds, that you're paying the kind of salaries that... Um, that there's an outcry when charities get them here. There was an outcry over the scale of, of a lot of employees in the FEI, not just John Delaney. So why don't we question more what the people in charge of the GA are paid? Is it because you're dealing with maybe two and a half thousand clubs and is it because they're returning figures like that and, and, and dealing for so many different units of the association? Is, is that why those figures were, were pretty much accepted in the mainstream? Well, it's the first time they've divulged that. Um, yeah. And I found it very strange that they would do it within a year putting up ticket prices for the All-Ireland Final. I think they're under that. pressure with Sport Ireland to do so. Well, and I think yeah. they have to divulge now this, the Director General salary soon. I think yeah, and be. Tom Ryan made it clear that they, they didn't have to divulge this mm. uh, in yesterday's account. Is this being so, transparent in the wake of what yeah, we've seen with other that's organisations? that's trying to convey this transparency. And, and I think Kieran makes a very good point there, that do we judge the GA as a conventional business operation. That's the question I was going to ask you. Because it is a fun, fundamentally an amateur organisation and is a, an organisation built essentially on volunteerism. So there's something very jarring about those mm. figures. It, it doesn't sit well with people and I, I'm, I'm quite surprised that until they got to the point where there had to be public divulgence of that that they've come out with this. Yeah, because even like one of the good news stories uh, on the surface of it is, is what's been done with Clonliffe College. In the fact, like, I, I wrote a piece recently on the, the story of the GA in the inner city in Dublin, and it's yeah, basically been neglected yeah. for a long, long yeah. time. And like, from, since 1966, they've only got two players, the footballers have only got two players between the canals, Ger Brennan and Paddy Cullen. Um, like there's, only one, there's, a, there's only one hurling club, St Kevin's, uh, and that's on, on the south inner city, and they've had huge struggles starting Dirt to get pitches, pitch, etc. Yeah. Um, so there's two new 4G pitches, which is great, and dressing rooms in the clubhouse. But at the same time, the GA, that's a big site now the GA bought there. They're building a hotel there, and they've sold a land for, I think, uh, 1,200 apartments there. And you're wondering, why are the GA getting involved in building hotels or uh, dealing with property developer building apartments? And I know the argument is a commercial one, that they need a huge amount of money to run the organisation, and it does filter down to clubs. But at the same time, it feeds into the notion that money is behind too many decisions. Surely you'd be better with six pitches there 
which would you know would be a huge help for the inner city. There's 116,000 people between the two canals. There's one football club left between the two canals, and they have mm. to play in Fairview Park on public land. So. I, th I think there's a, a very difficult balancing act that the GA are trying to do now between the commercial pressures that they feel and their original aim, which is, you know, a grassroots game. Would, would you see level. what Kieran is speaking about? Would you agree with that, Vincent, or would you see an element of foresight? And I mean, we've we made the point that for every euro they get in, they redistribute 80, 80 cent back to the to the units um, to go down the Clonliffe uh, College route. It's a big project. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ambition involved in it. Um, that probably leans the, the association towards looking down the line and maybe trying to protect or safeguard its future. But are they better off doing that or, as Kieran says, investing it into pitches? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, on the one level you're looking at it, is it, it looks like really smart business, that it mm. will generate money. And it's, it's a very good site to have. And, and I, I think they've got it. Now, it's 22 million, but there's more add-ons to come, so I don't know what they're mm. going to get at eventually. But it seems to me like a smart business move, but is that what you want from the mm. GA all the That's time? It, you know, I think this and, conflict is there constantly with yeah, them, yeah. And, and this thing of investing in infrastructure, and I know we're going to get on to this, and about putting all this money into stadiums when, do you know, do they really have to be doing that? Yeah. You know, we look at Parky Kiev, how, and, and the finances of that, how vital was it that Cork had a... 45, 50,000 capacity stadium that might be filled once or twice yeah. a year. That's one of the negative points of the GEA financial report yesterday, Kieran. And it's a major uh, negative. Like, that yeah. could be an albatross around their neck. That's 30 million debt, 31 million debt for, for years. And concerts would be few and far between yeah, there, too. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Like, there's a, so many venues looking for concerts. You know, and there's only, as, they said, not, uh, as was pointed out yesterday, not many bands are touring this year. And that mm. can happen in different years, that they're all trying to get one or two bands are touring. And you do look at that and you go, sure, sure, it's a Cork project, but it got a huge amount of state funding. And you think it's central level. There should have been far more scrutiny on what was going on. Mm. And suddenly it's, it seems to be landed in people that, oh, God, we have to deal with this. And, and what, like, you know, like, you know, your own county, Semple Stadium, look at the size of Semple Stadium, Fitzgerald Stadium, the Gaelic Grounds and Parker Keep, all roughly 50,000, 45, 50,000 capacity in one province, yeah. and how many times are they used? Like, what is the yeah. point of it? I think there's, there's an elephant in the room here, and, and that is how an organisation that can be so well run, as we've seen from the accounts, that has its own turf farm in the Knoll mm. for replacing the pitch in Croke Park, but someone had their eye off the ball with what went on in Cork, and it seems mm. to me Michael Foley um, tweeted a link to a, an interview done in 2014 with Frank Murphy last night, in which Frank Murphy is quoted as saying that for Parker Keeve there will be no bank debt. We will mm. not be taking anything from the banks. They're a long way off that. They owe 20 million to the banks right now. Yeah. Send the, 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 the GA itself is in for 10 million. Mm. And you have Tom Ryan using this expression now for future projects. Centralised. Central overview, or oversight, I think is what he used. Central oversight. Well, do you know what? The disparity between what it set out to be, which was a £70 million stadium, 40 million later, if you went on the Peter McKenna figures of 110, which have come back now, mm. it's now back at 98. But it seemed to me that this was a real solar run by the people in Cork, mm. and they convinced the people in Croke Park that they were in control of this. And now, as we speak, we're sitting here, there's 30 million owed on this stadium. And it's a magnificent stadium. It's a pleasure to go to it. And the old place was a kip. But who had their eye off the ball here? This is, a, this is extraordinary. And they're talking about, well, they have assets that they can sell for 10 million. So best case scenario, there'll mm. be a 20 million debt on this. Now, no one's going to tell me that's not going to impact on all the other projects, Navin, <coughs> on Newbridge, on, what's the other one? Caseman Park. Ca mm. Caseman Park. Caseman mm. Park particularly, mm. which is now in a really invidious position where the GA agreed to giving something like 18 million in 2011 yeah. when all of this other funding was coming from London essentially. But my understanding is in 2011, it was on the basis of rugby and soccer being played in Caseman Park. Yeah. We now have Ravenhill redeveloped. We now have Windsor Park redeveloped. So even those figures, which the price has now gone up 30 million for Caseman Park since then, and 
we're kind of thinking, well, who's going to come up with that money? Mm. And okay. especially in the context of Parky Keeve. Interesting debate. We'll, uh, we'll definitely talk about this again, but uh, for now, Vincent and Kieran, thanks so much for your time. Now, we've got plenty more live Allianz League action on Airsport this weekend. You can join us on Airsport 1 on Saturday as Dublin travel to Dr Cullen Park to take on Carlo. And that's in the Division 1B group uh, hurling clash. We're on air at quarter to five for that one. And straight away afterwards, we've got more hurling for you. Limerick face Waterford in the Gaelic grounds, and that's in Group A of Division 1. But my thanks again to Vincent and Kieran for their insight tonight. A great debate was had on Pressback. We'll be back at the same time next week to discuss all the latest happenings in the GEA world. Good night for now. <laughs>